Greetings, brethren. Hmm, some big gaps out there. Glad you're here tonight. In one accord. Tonight we're going to have our first uh, review or summation of Genesis. I originally planned about three of these, but I'm not. I'm not sure now how many it will be. This is the 83rd <coughs> gathering on this book. I've called these reviews examples of apostolic expressions that are found in Genesis. As a text for these considerations, I wanted to use 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that, or in order that, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. <clears throat> now the source of Scripture is often mentioned by the prophets and the apostles and Jesus. They often tell you where it come from. It seems as though there's a, a tendency in humanity to idolize the book. As a, as a, so he might constantly reminds you this came from God. This is not like a library, part of the library. This came from God. And what Genesis does, Genesis puts a framework in place to help shape your concept about God. A lot of people's idea about God is just their own, their own idea. They just was what they think. The book establishes the Lord's reactions, for example, to to obedience. It tells you his action to disobedience. You don't, why I'm saying this, you don't have to guess about these. His reaction to faith and to faithfulness and to unfaithfulness and to self-will and to human plans that don't include him. And a lot more. See, it shapes how you think about God. If a professed believer proceeds through life as though these things weren't true. His life becomes vain. No matter how successful it may seem, it's a pointless, aimless, profitless life. No matter how it, how it appears. Furthermore, The book of Genesis helps us understand how God leads people into being more discerning and more profitable. He exposes them to more of himself, more of his purpose, more of his plan. This is how a person grows. A person doesn't grow by being able to do more or being able to do special things. Growth is in the context of God himself, in him. We live and move and have our being. No one should expect to be advanced in spiritual life if divine revelation is deliberately ignored. It doesn't make any difference how much they go to church or how much they study the literature. It doesn't make any difference. They will not advance. God's desire is that they be men in understanding. Men in understanding. And you, you don't become men in understanding just like for praying. You do, you do pray for wisdom. You become men of understanding by exposing yourself to what God has said and what God has done. And that's limited to Scripture. There's no other books about this. 
For instance, Josephus, a Jewish historian, was familiar with Jesus. He gives a little picture of what he looked like. But he didn't say anything about what he said. Not a syllable. Or comment on what he meant. Or why he came. See, there's only one, there's only one volume in the world that is an authoritative volume on this subject. Amen. That is scripture. All scripture Amen. is given by inspiration of God. Amen. Now Genesis also reveals to us man's inaptitude or lack of ability to resolve the situation that a single transgression caused. Yeah. Scripture points out, it points to one single sin. And the accumulated wisdom of men over a period of 4,000 years could not resolve the dilemma that one sin, yeah. just one, uh -huh. just one, couldn't resolve what that caused. And before long, the capacity has deteriorated, so people today aren't as, don't have as much thinking power as people originally did. Adam couldn't resolve his dilemma, not even resolve the dilemma of just himself, what he did. Enoch, who walked with God, he couldn't resolve it. He walked with God. He couldn't, he couldn't resolve it. Abraham, who believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, he couldn't resolve. So all of this is told, made known in Genesis. I remember this is my point I'm making. This is what's made known in Genesis. These, these men couldn't resolve it. The Jewish fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all of which had personal revelations from God, all of which never in disobeyed God, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't resolve it. Joseph was led by God to become the governor of Egypt hey. and to teach the Pharaoh's senators wisdom, but he, he, couldn't, he couldn't make any progress in this area. He couldn't resolve the sins his brothers committed just against him, say nothing to the rest of the world. Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph these are superior men, gifted of God. They're in the book of Genesis. And together, they couldn't do what needs to be done. Whereas any person born of a woman, with the single exception of Jesus, who's been able by nature to outdo Adam, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, <laughs> Nobody, nobody, to say nothing about doing Jesus himself. There's only one man, the man Christ Jesus, who can resolve this. Jesus himself isn't preached a lot in Genesis, but what's, what's revealed in Genesis is nobody else could do it. Because this was humanity at, at, its, at its peak, naturally speaking, at its peak. He couldn't, uh, couldn't resolve it. See, it's not necessary to teach a course on this subject to persuade humanity of their impotence. It's right here in the book of Genesis. Now, if all scripture is given by inspiration of God, then Genesis was given by inspiration of God. Amen. If all scripture is profitable for doctrine, then Genesis is profitable for doctrine. Amen. If all scripture is profitable for Reproof, then Genesis is profitable for reproof. Yes. And if all scripture is profitable for instruction in righteousness, Genesis is profitable for instruction in righteousness and for correction as well. Yes. Amen. All scripture was given that the man of God may be perfect. <clears throat> and if that all scripture includes Genesis, then man can't be perfect in the sense of that text and remain ignorant of Genesis. I mean, I'm, these are just kind of <laughs> obvious conclusions, but I thought it necessary, necessary to make them. Now, the book of Genesis 
contains the following, and much should be made of this. When we're exposed to people who are evolutionists or historians and they tell us what they, we should be quick to tell them what we know, what, what our gods told us. Genesis has told us the record of creation. <clears throat> it can't be found anywhere else. The origin of mankind, the origin of marriage, the first birth, the origin of sin, the promise of the, of the devil, the first sin, the punishment of sin, the first murder, specific events involving individuals and nations and even an entire world, the promises of God, we're introduced to the promises of God, the empowerment of God, Abraham and Joseph, the giving of wisdom, Noah to build the ark, Joseph to govern Egypt, family conflict, we're introduced to that, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, Ishmael and Isaac, Joseph and his brothers, the power and effectiveness of faith, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Men attempting to do something without divine response, builders of Shinar, kings of the east, men of Sodom, a relatively small number of chosen people defeating five great armies, Abraham, God divulges his purpose to chosen people, gave his purpose to Santa Fe to Noah, gave his purpose concerning Israel to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, <coughs> We have record of God working miraculously in the creation and the preservation of Noah and Abraham's defeat, Sodom and Gomorrah's destruction, elevation of Joseph. See, we're introduced to all these things that God does. People can't say that this passed away. The persecution of the righteous in Isaac and in Joseph, that some things can't be changed by prayer, Abraham praying for Sodom, we're introduced to the idea of a substitutionary sacrifice with the ram substituted for Isaac. Where we see God managing circumstances for his glory. We see the direction of people by dreams. God giving one person favor with another person. All this in Genesis. The sudden and effective change of one status, just overnight, it was Joseph. The impartation of wisdom, Joseph, no one building the ark. The multiplication of people under impossible circumstances, Israel multiplied before, before Jacob died. The formation of a, nature, a nation through whom Jesus would come. See, God formed this nation. The faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the judgment of God, the election and calling of God. See, all those things are made known in, in Genesis. As it's a small sample, brief introduction. Yes. Kind of put yourself in the place of some of these people. There was there was nothing for them to fall back on for understanding. Like whenever uh, Abraham was told to offer Isaac, Abraham Abraham didn't have any other examples to see that That's God right. was merciful and that that sacrifice was a, a human sacrifice was never something that he would personally desire. The willingness to do that, the obedience of faith, was the sacrifice God was really looking for from Abraham, but. It's just like it's like if you'd never been on the water and all of a sudden you cast off into the Pacific. You don't know anything about the storms. You don't know yeah. anything about the territory, mm -hmm. what's out there. I mean, these firsts are very significant. Oh, yeah. oh amen. They're like, amen. They're like leading the way into an area that man has never been before. Amen. Amen. Yes. It's, it's most excellent to see. Now, what I want to deal with here, I'm dealing with because some people teach 
of which I was once a member. Some people teach that the law and the prophets have been done away. Now our text is all scripture is profitable. I'm going to ask the question, is the law still profitable? I'm going to answer it now. Now the scripture tells us that the, that the law, is, that the old covenant waxed old and is ready to vanish away. Was that the Ten Commandments? That's what I'm going to answer. 2 Corinthians 3, 6, and 11 says that it, the glory of it paled and passed away. Was that Genesis and through Deuteronomy? The law is said to have been ended, Romans 10, 4. Doesn't that contradict the statement that all Scripture is profitable? See, that's what we want to answer. I want to establish, first of all, that the Old Covenant was not the law itself. Technically, the law was, was the words of the covenant. Not the covenant itself. The covenant was the agreement of the people to do the law. Right. Everybody can see that, can't you? That's what the, that's what the covenant was. Right. Yeah. He, Moses took the book of the covenant, read it in the audience of the people, and they said, here's the covenant now. Yeah. All that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning these words. So the covenant was the people agreed it, and God agreed to those terms. Yeah. That's what we're going to do. I'll bless you if you do all, use all the commandments which you said you were going to do. Now the old covenant was what we call a bilateral covenant. It had, it had two sides, God's side, Israel's side. Now let's go over some of these texts again. Exodus 19, 7 and 8. All the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. Because he, he had to agree, yeah. I'll accept that commitment. Again, Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Therefore, if you obey my voice indeed, keep my covenant, then you shall be my people, treasure unto me above all peoples, and you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So Moses told the people, and the people said, we'll, we agree, we'll do it. Again, Deuteronomy, I mean, I'm establishing that the, the law itself, the Ten Commandments, was not the covenant. It was the words of the covenant or the words they agreed to do. Right. If ye will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do my, my commandments, but that ye break my covenant. And then the apostolic doctrine teaches they did, in fact, break the covenant. The covenant was we will do it, and they didn't do it even though they had fully intended to do it, when they said it, they intended to do it, they were afraid. They were trembling, but they couldn't do it. And I'll not read any more, but that, the old covenant was the agreement of the people to do what God said. Now when Moses returned with these words to the people, God had to ratify this, say, all right, I'll, that, was my, this is, that was my covenant, if you do this, I will do that. And here's what it, God, here's how God responded in Deuteronomy 5.29. I have heard the voice of the words of this people, and they have spoken unto thee. They have well said all that they have spoken. This is fair. This is a good promise. Then he adds, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. See, he, he knew he knew they, they weren't going to do they weren't going to do it but he, he, he desired that they did I wish they could do what they said they had a heart for it 1500 years of administration under the old covenant confirmed that people really didn't have a heart to do it they broke the covenant but the law continued on yes. hmm? they broke it the covenant but the law con continued on the scriptures put it this way, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Amen. 
to everyone that believeth. Other versions read unto righteousness or leads to righteousness. The law doesn't lead to righteousness. You're not righteous because you did what the law said. Maybe you did today. I'll concede that maybe maybe there'll be a minute or two yeah, yeah. where you could actually, you know, yeah. do it. Yeah. But you had to always do it. Right. That was the covenant. They were always going to do it. Every place they went, they'd do it. Every day, they'd do it. Every part of their life, they'd do it. They never would break a single commandment. They resolved not to do it. That was the covenant. But the Lord Jesus Christ ended the covenant as a means to righteousness. But the law continued on. It's a schoolmaster. <clears throat> See, it's not, it's not passed away. How could a schoolmaster be dead? Schoolmaster has to be in effect. It's still a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. Remains in that, uh, in that capacity. And it defines sin. It still does by the law. It is the knowledge of sins. See? But it's not there as a covenant. It's not there. So I say that to show that the old covenant has, has passed away, but the law still exists, but not as a means, so it's profitable. At my point, we're tying this in with all Scripture is profitable. All right, now, now I'm, let's begin this summation of Genesis. First, to deal with the phrase, the beginning, the beginning. <clears throat> now, a person has to have a perspective what he, what this is like. You can't go back further in your understanding than the beginning. This is, your, this is the place you start your thinking. And from the beginning to the end, that's the space of, that's time. That's the space of time. That from beginning to the end, that's the time you prepare for what's beyond time. Be in another sphere. Now, we only have sparse information about what took place before the creation, and not much at all, and it's not in much detail. God's referred to as the eternal God, so we know, all right, there's sure a lot to think about, not a lot to think about, but a lot happened before time. And he had, Jesus said he had glory with the Father before the world was, he said it was back in eternity past, for want of a better term. And Jesus said to the Father, You love me before the foundation of the world. So that's the. But when it comes to thinking, reasoning, coming up to right conclusions, you've got to begin with the beginning. Amen. That's Amen. in Genesis. I want to establish that this, this is what God did. He starts, that's your reference point. The, be the beginning is not before the world was. That's not where you start. Right. You start at the beginning and then he tells you about what was before. Here's some examples. Take the person of Christ. He has identified with before the world. See the world, see the beginning is, is the reference point. He doesn't say the world came after eternity. That's you start, you start your reasoning with the beginning, in the beginning. Amen. You start there. When we think of Jesus, we remember that he was the man. But he was infinitely more than a man, but we got to start within the beginning. And think about Jesus. Think about divine wisdom. How are you, how are you to think about divine wisdom? We speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world. See, there it is again. The world's your reference point. You may be tempted to like try and probe into before the world and think, no, nah, don't do it. You got the beginning sufficient right there. Amen. That's where you got to start. Maybe in the world to come, I don't doubt that we're in the world to come that we'll have no more about the eternity past, but we're not now. God's purpose and grace, you want to understand God's purpose and grace, you've got to start with the beginning. Who has saved us and called us with, an, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. See, the world began. Is the, see that? It's the, it's the reference point. And the Savior, who was foreordained before the foundation of the world. There it is again. You've got to go back to the beginning and say, all right, all of this thing about salvation was in place yeah. in the beginning. Amen. 
That confirms it can't change. I don't know if eternity was either. I don't know. It was. A, you can't be measured how long these things were. But they were all in place when the world was created. That's your reference point. So whatever God purposed to do was at the beginning. It was it was cast in stone. So there's no change of plan. That's right. Eternal life is pivotal in spiritual thinking. Here's how the scriptures speak about it. In hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. There it is again. He takes you back to the beginning of the world. The divine choice. God, according to this, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. There it is. So, so the choice was before the creation. Amen. That's, right. That's what it says. Creation is the reference point. See, you need this to be to be confident, to be assured, and be stable. It's not things aren't going to shift around. Amen. It was all in place before. And Jesus himself was from the beginning. Twice he referred to from the beginning of the creation. Jesus said of Satan, he was a murderer from the beginning. See, so it takes you back. It's a point of reason, the beginning. Now the, the apostles, they, re, they reasoned on this way too. It took you back to the beginning. The fellowship of the mystery has been hid in God who created all things from Christ. It was from the beginning. The mystery that, that Paul was unveiling, the mystery Paul was unveiling didn't start in Paul's day. It was from the foundation of the world, back before then. We were chosen unto salvation from the beginning. Second Thessalonians 2.13 The Lord Jesus was from the beginning, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. He refers, John refers to him as him that is from the beginning. So the, the same personality that was in the beginning is the one you're trusting today. It's not, it's not different, it's not upgraded, it's not changed, same person. The devil, devil sinneth from the beginning, John said, 1 John 3. He hasn't changed, hasn't altered. You want to know about the devil? You got it right there in the beginning. You get all the information you need to avoid him. The creation. Thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth, so that you're the one that's had that initiated this beginning. The works of God were finished from the foundation of the world. See it? Yes, Brother Jason. Uh, the fact that we begin this way really is a, a huge contrast <laughs> to, to any other worldview out there. Amen. The, all, almost all pagan understandings of history are cyclical every everything just goes around like a merry-go-round the, the the application of that way of thinking is that basically history is meaningless mm -hmm. that's right and the scriptures are scripture is going to point out history is not meaningless there is a there is a god who is guiding it therefore it can't it can't be meaningless like it can't just be like a dog chasing its tail. Yeah. And see, if you if you know anything about other cosmologies and, and myths about the creation of the world and paganism, in the ancient world, even up till today, they almost all have this idea that basically life is just it's a meaningless cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the scriptures is the scriptures immediately destroying that view. Amen. By in the beginning, God Amen. created. Th those words that destroys every other worldview that's out there even today amen yeah. amen see reincarnation is this cycle you're talking about stage two that it is god that is doing something uh-huh that's right i mean um, even uh, I, the norse the norse uh Myths. First off, their their beginnings are very ambiguous if they have one, and there's never any purpose. There's no, I mean, it, you just have this fantastical story, and it doesn't have any real significance. If anything, man is incidental and in the way and at jeopardy, and uh, he's he's not even 
the point of anything. So even if you knew about them, it doesn't do you any good to know about them. They're, they're vain, thoroughly. Uh, but whatever it says, in the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. Now that sets the tone for everything. That's right. Amen. God. And so men are to look to God for everything else that He, mm -hmm. that he reveals. Because it's God that has purpose, and God that is working, and God that is upholding. We're not the point. We, God is doing something, and we're the product of what He's doing. Amen. Mm -hmm. See, if, if the purpose of God and everything was before the foundation of the world, then what God is doing is what He planned to do. That's right, amen. <laughs> it's a completely different view. God is doing what he purposed to do. He purposed to do it before the beginning. When, when the beginning started, then he started working out his plan. So the thought that he's there to work out your plan, see, this is, this is utterly absurd. Amen. He's working out his. Amen. And the works were finished, as I said. The works were, what God was going to do, so far as determination was concerned, it was done before he started making the world. He's seen simplistic, but anything created couldn't possibly subvert his plan. That's right. It, it, even even Satan, he was created. He couldn't. He yeah. couldn't subvert it. Actually, he's been used yeah. along the way. He's a he's like a worker for God, and he doesn't even really know it. No. Amen. Amen. See the sufferings of Christ. If it was repetitive, it would have had to go back before the foundation of the world. Yeah. If Jesus, see, that's, that's the point of Hebrews 9, 25, and 26. If Jesus suffered over and over and over, like Catholicism teaches, then he would have had to suffer before the foundation of the world. See, see the reasoning. And he was ordained before the foundation of the world. And names are written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. So that's the reference point for us. Remove the book of Genesis from your consideration, and a certain mystery hangs over everything else. Actually, God himself is the ultimate reality. To properly account for the origin of anything that's real, you've got to trace it back to, back to God. So that's the purpose for in the beginning. Now let's look at... Creation was accomplished in the light. And now we're pointing out how this is referenced all through the rest of Scripture. These things are referenced. We're introduced to both, both darkness and light in the book of Genesis. Darkness was first. Darkness was first. The earth is without form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. So that was darkness was first. Then the first command of God was to let there be light, so the rest of creation was done in the light. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to draw some conclusions <laughs> from this. Then God, he divided light, he divided light from darkness. Called a light day, darkness night, and the two can't be blended. God Almighty has separated them. The world is not intended to be like an eternal twilight either in the nature or in the spirit. Life was not intended to be lived when it's half dark. And you think how often light is mentioned in Scripture. It, and it's in view of Genesis. My point is it's in view of Genesis that light is mentioned. It's not in view of the uh, observations of astronomers. Jesus is the light of the world. Saints are the light of the world. Saints are the children of light. We have the armor of light. God brings to light certain matters. We have the armor of light, the, the light of the glorious gospel, the light of the knowledge of God. Light conflicts with darkness. Light makes manifest. Awake from the dead in Christ will give you light. Life and immortality were brought to light. It's called marvelous light and on. You see, he reads light is a major part 
of the message received from God. But if you don't have an understanding of Genesis, it, these are just words. Yeah. Like you think of you think of what every day you see the sun come up and go down. But you've got to go back to Genesis to see that light's commanded. Yeah. Yeah. There isn't such a thing as light that God doesn't command. Yeah, this light was four days before the sun was That's created. right. Mm -hmm. That's before right. Before there was anything observable by anything That's right. that was made. Just light. That's right. Yeah. This was the light from which the sun and moon got their light. Yeah. <laughs> Reflect they were actually reflectors of it, I guess you'd say. And God still works in the light. Just like before he ever started now. The creation, first thing, light. God never works in the darkness. He always works in the light. Yeah, amen. You want to know what God's doing? You got to get in the light. Yeah. Satan still works in darkness. The new creation follows the same orders of natural creation. Darkness first, light second. Ignorance first, illumination second. God works in this light, driving out darkness. See, it's darkness drives out light. Now look at another aspect of light. Let there be light. Let there be. Or he commanded the light to shine out of darkness. So far as the origin of heaven and earth are concerned, they are not associated with the first creative act of God. The first creative act of God was, let there be light. Isaiah said God formed the light. Isaiah 45, 7. Paul said he commanded the light. See, you've got to connect this with redemption. See, this is my point now, is that the things that we... He speaks to us in a certain language in the epistles, and the language is rooted back there in Genesis. So, so if you're able to see something for God said or God did, you're able to perceive it, God commanded that light. See, there was a time when you didn't see it, that was darkness. Right. Amen. To me, this is quite marvelous. Yeah. Nothing of the spiritual order is created in an environment of darkness. Well, let's say it another way. God doesn't reveal things to people while they're in the dark. Yeah. Ignorance will never produce revelation. Yeah, right. To get revelation, you've got to get in the light, and only God can command the light, see? So you can't make yourself understand the things of God. There's only a, a few things that a person are going to hear while they're in the dark and darkness, and, and perhaps that is like you need to get out of the darkness and into the light. You see what I'm saying? There, there, there's, there's a limited amount of, 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 of preaching that you even do to people in the dark. You see, they're, they're limited in their capacity. Yeah. But there, we have a message for those in the dark. But it's, it's limited. You don't tell them all the deep things of salvation. Yeah, you can't. That's why most of, the, most of the messages in Acts to the lost were about sin. You just have to read through them and see if this isn't the case. Most all of them were about sin. Once the people in the light, then the message, the message picked up. So recreation is in fact likened to creation. God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, natural creation, has shined into our hearts, new creation. All spiritual illumination comes from God. And now the scripture says of us, it describes as the darkness is past and the light is now shining. All right, that's like the first day. It's like when the sun went the first day. The darkness passed and the light was shining. So you go back to Genesis and you can... You can make this correlation. A new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shines. See? Don't walk in darkness when his light's been shining. In creation, darkness still existed on a daily basis, but it wasn't mixed with light, and it wasn't the time to do things. All growth or benefit or blessing is re are realized in the light. They're all done in the light. Now let's look at light shining. 
projecting out. Paul said he commanded the light to shine as to shine forth to push darkness, push darkness out. Commanded it. So Jesus said to his disciples, let your light so shine. See? This was the prelude to what the light shining was a prelude to what God was going to do. There is an additional area from which light comes or emits from the believer. Light that's in them emanates. But he lets let he doesn't say make your light shine. That's right. He says, let it shine. See, God is the one that can cause your life to have influence. But you've got to get the obstacles out of the way. Amen. Get the darkness out of the way. And so we read things like this. The forgiveness of sins, dark, dealing with darkness, is in order to be reconciled to God in the light. So they got to get, the darkness has got to pass. It's got to pass. And you're reconciled to God in order for divine fellowship. See, you're, and you have divine fellowship or tulid so that God can direct you. And God directs you so you can impact the environment we occupy in order that God might be glorified. And God is glorified in order that we might share in the reign of Christ. See, the, the light extends itself. Like, it, like the, it rises to a peak. The sun rises to a peak in the day. Your light rises to a peak. The peak is God's going to get all the glory for your life. So Jesus said, let your light so shine. What happened when we began living spiritually is that God commanded the light to shine. <laughs> it's, it's simple, and it, but from one point of view, it's amazingly simple. But from another, this is very difficult for man to get a hold of. There's all kind of programs to try and teach you how to make your light shine. But it's the but same way the natural light shined. God commands it to shine out of darkness. John the Baptist is referred to as a burning and a shining light. It also says that he was not the light. He just came to bear witness to the light. See, but when someone's making something known about what God's doing, that person's a light. Yeah, that's right. So let your light so shine. Doesn't mean do a bunch of good deeds, right. although you will. Your life should show what God is doing. Amen. That's the point. Paul told the Philippians, he said, I want you to be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine. See, there's that word. Let, he commanded the light to shine. Let, among whom ye shine. Yes. Here's how it works. Uh, well, brethren, as you walk by faith and you live in the Spirit and you're, you're living unto God, God will command the light to shine out of your life. Amen. And you'll be able to say, it wasn't me, it was the grace of God that was in me. See, you, see the people of God, they're children of light. There's no such thing as a Christian that people can't connect with God. Just blot that out of your mind. There's no such thing. There are these kind of people. I mean, I admit that. There are a lot of kind of people that you'd never, you don't know whether they're a Buddhist or whether they're a Christian. You don't know. You don't even know if they're an, some people, if they're an atheist or they're a Christian. You, you have no idea. But when God commands the light to shine, you get an idea. And you make those associations. So light, you see how much is built on the light. And Genesis tells us about Satan's beguilement. Paul said he, he feared lest his Satan beguiled Eve through his subtlety so the minds of, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ. And we know Satan, Jesus as the tempter. Now, when do you suppose is the first time the word tempt is mentioned in the Bible? 
I might think it'd be mentioned way back there. But then it was mentioned back there is the people tempted God. All the time. You go, you, if you want to take the time to search it out, every time, that's what it was. The people tempted God. First time it said Satan tempted somebody. First time it's categorically said Jesus, Satan tempted somebody is when Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. That's the first time those words were used. Even though we know that Satan tempted Eve, but the concept of temptation was developed over a long period of time. So beguilement. Temptation is beguilement. Satan beguiles people. He convinces them that whatever he wants them to do is an advantage to them in some way. But it was called beguilement, but temptation. We learn about temptation. And Satan's temptations are beguilements. He's not just simply trying to get people to do this or do that. That's He's trying to get them to think doing this or doing that will bring an advantage to them. That's what he's trying to do. And all sins that way. Nobody will sin if they think it's going to hurt them. They, won't, they wouldn't do it. James presents the process of temptation. This is from the experiential viewpoint. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. For those familiar, and for those familiar with the scripture, there is no need to identify the process of temptation. Genesis gives you the category. He knows he can't get anybody to sin unless they want to. That's the only way. That's the only way they'll concede to sin. So what does he do? He he gets them to want to. How did he do that? He poses this: "You'll be like gods." They, You'll be, you'll be a lot more satisfied if you do this. Huh? This will bring you some relief if you do this. See, he'll, he'll promise us something. This, this is Satan's, Satan's tactics. Yes. That's, that's why you've made this point many times. That's why the, the Genesis account, the point is not really what they did. Right. It could have been anything. Yeah. That, what, I think people kind of, they kind of like think like it was some kind of a, that fruit was something magical or something, but God just simply said, don't eat from the tree. Could have told them any number of things. Yes. The point was is that they were declaring their independence yes. from God. Yes. Well said. Well yes. said. Amen. Well said. That's what self-will is, isn't it? It's, independent, it's deep independence from God. Man actually prefers that. That's right. In his alienated yes. state, yeah. unless unless you are reconciled to God and regenerated, yeah. people in their natural state prefer to be independent from God. I don't Amen. want somebody telling me what to do. Uh -huh. that's, uh -huh. that's human nature. Uh -huh. right. You see how wrong it is to try and cook up a procedure to make yeah. people acceptable to God? Because you really can't change a person's will. Only God can change a person's will Amen. for good, shall I say. Amen. Now, another thing we see in Genesis, we're introduced to the concept of strangership. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, all three were told about being strangers in the earth. And Hebrews 11, 13 says they confess they're strangers in the earth, strangers and pilgrims in the earth. They were in a place that wasn't home to them. They... They couldn't control where they lived, but they didn't belong there and they knew it. They had to live as a stranger. That is, they couldn't adopt the customs of that particular country. They couldn't do it. In Scripture, a stranger is one who is in a country to which he does not belong. He's not in a homeland. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all died in the promised land. Or well, Jacob didn't die in the promised Yes, he didn't die in the promised land. He's buried in the promised land. They, but none of them had a permanent home there. Yeah. Uh -huh. hmm. Their own property. Yeah. So they were strangers and pilgrims in a land that was promised. Strangers in the land of promise. Well, we're, uh, we're the same way. 
Let the meek of the earth shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. See, we're, we're going to inherit a glorified earth that we're, that we're walking in. We're walking in it. It won't be glorified, but we're walking in the earth. We're, going to, it's, we're strangers here because there's enemies here. Wherever, wherever enemies are, we're strangers. You can't, you can't be a citizen where strangers are, yeah. or where evil people are, yeah, in this world. And Israel was strangers in Egypt, and that was more akin to us in the world, being strangers in the world. Until it comes to the point where you feel and sense you don't belong here. Until that time comes, you will really not make very much progress, if any, Amen. in the kingdom of God. Amen. And preaching and so forth has to reflect that. So we're introduced to strangership. And we're introduced to the concept of Christ in the church, what's involved in Christ in the church, is seen in Adam and Eve. The commencement of humanity was actually an introduction to what God is going to do with the church. He took something from Adam, and of the something from Adam, he made Eve, which means Eve had something from Adam that was in her. And both of them were creations. It's said in Genesis 127, male and female created he them. So both of them were creations. It's going to parallel. What Jesus was, he was, Jesus was a special man that was made by God. Yeah. And the church is created. Amen. And then they're joined, yeah. they're joined together. Jesus is associated with Adam. He's the first, he's the last Adam and the second man. Yeah. Second man, the last Adam. Now it says in Ephesians, they're commenting on uh, the church's relationship to Jesus. It says, we are of his flesh and of his bone. All right, that's, that's hearkening you back <laughs> to Genesis. When he took a rib out, it isn't that it was a bone-dry rib that he pulled out of there. It was a rib with flesh, flesh and bone. See, flesh and bone. Eve was made for Adam, and the church is made for Christ. So we're one flesh. As a husband and wife are one flesh, we're one spirit. It's a very real merging of two into one. You have uh, in this uh, pictorial presentation, you've got Adam, out of him came Eve, Together they became one flesh. You have Christ, part of Christ, we become partakers of Christ, and together we're one flesh and one body. See? It's the exact parallel. So if you want to understand Christ in the church, you you go back to uh, Genesis. Now let's look at the entrance of sin and death. It's important that we know about the entrance of sin and death. Sin didn't enter in a big mass. It entered by one act of disobedience. Sin entered by one act. Yeah. See, it can really be a small opening. One act. Yeah, amen. A lot of people think it has to be a big opening. One act of disobedience. Sin entered and it affected the entire cosmos and the natural creation yeah. and all of humanity. And it's raining in both areas, it's raining yeah. from one act. The first time sin is used in the Bible, the word sin, first time sin is used in the Bible was a, a while after Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden. It's when God said to Cain, sin lieth at the door. That's the first time that word is mentioned. The next time the word is used in Scripture is about 2,000 years later. When Sodom, the set of Sodom, their sin was very grievous. Now, still, the point out here is it took a while to tutor men in what sin was. See, it was, 
when you think, when you realize how little that word was used, it because men didn't understand it, it had to be expounded and opened up, opened up to people. And there's still people I suppose have a lot of trouble. They do have a lot of trouble with sin entering by Adam. They, theologians argue about this, and they have for hundreds of years. They've argued about this. Prior to the apostles, the sum total of what's said about trans the transgression of Adam and Eve is as follows. And it's is Genesis 3, 1 through 5, tells you about the provocation, how sin Satan provoked it. The act is described in Genesis 3, 6 through 7. The confrontation with God is described in Genesis 3, 8 through 10. Divine interrogation is described in Genesis 3, 1 through 13, or 11 through 13. The judgment of sin is described in Genesis 3, 14 through 19. The provision of covering is described in Genesis 3, 21, and the expulsion from the garden is in Genesis 3, 24. That's a total account, that's a total account for sin that's in the Bible. It's 695 words that account for the origin of sin. It's about one and a half typewritten pages. All right. There are in the King James Bible 588,280 words. Of that, the total explanation of sin is one thousandth of one percent. But you're expected to derive a whole lot from that. There's a lot to be learned from that account. Who cannot see that when it comes to proper understanding, the count on the words in no way approximates their value and indispensability. There are words that are very, very weighty. There are words that you can hardly put anything into them. They're shallow words. They're like buckets that are very shallow. There's other words that are in the account of sin. Here's what you learned in the, the account. The source of beguilement, the vulnerability of humanity, Satan's effort to make the lawless appealing, Satan twisting the word of God, the spread of sin from one to others, sin smiting the conscience, sin makes a person afraid to confront God. God will confront the sinner. God will demand an explanation for sin. From the beginning, it was difficult for men to admit they disobeyed God. Even a single act of disobedience carries with it accountability. Sin drives one away from God. Sin keeps men from partaking of what keeps them alive. Sin caused death and everything related to it, which would decline, weakness, sickness, so forth. A single act of disobedience brought a universal curse. A single act of disobedience made all men sinners. A single act of disobedience brought judgment unto condemnation upon all humanity. Death reigns because of Adam's sin. Sin cannot be rectified by human effort. Sin is not disturbed. Satan is not disturbed in any way when he's defeated. Satan's beguilements appeal to self-interest. Satan misrepresents God. For men to be accepted by God, a new race had to be created. All this in that abbreviated account. So it should establish to us once and for all that there is no physical or geographic area that can neutralize Satan's effort. I mean, let's think about the place where sin occurred. It was in a morally and spiritually ideal environment. In the creation when it was new and uncontaminated. In a blessed and beautiful place in a place where there was no sin, rebellion, waywardness, or hardness, in a place where abundant provision had been given with only a single prohibition. Sin, this is where sin took place here, right. where the prohibition had been clearly stated together with the penalty for failing to do it, in a place where there was presumed access to God, where no dissatisfaction or deficiency was yet experienced unless Adam found it unsatisfactory not finding a wife, but that was resolved. And where there was no cause for any existence, for the existence or feeling of inadequacy. That's the condition under which sin entered. <laughs> uh -huh. 
Well, I'll tell you, you do some heavy thinking about this. It'll, it'll show you the need of leaning on the Lord, the need of faith, need for living for God, because you, you can't produce a better environment than what that was in that garden. About our external environment. You can't produce a better environment. But right there's where it happened, and it happened in the beginning. All right, does that mean there's a possibility that sin's going to break out in heaven again? Well, that question has been asked by a number of peop people. So I thought, I, would, I thought it would be well to cite, from my own perspective, some reasons why no, it will not be in heaven. Satan will not be there. His angels have already been expelled. Satan and his angels will be confined to the lake of fire. The holy angels have already proved they can't be drawn away. All non-angelic wicked personalities will be confined to the lake of fire. The heavens themselves have been purified with superior blood. There will be no darkness there. Nothing temporal will be there. The redeemed of the Lord being a superior creation will have the very nature of God. There will be no darkness or night as there was at the first creation. There will be no death there, for it too is cast into the lake of fire. Every foe shall have been vanquished by Jesus, bowed before him and consigned to the lake of fire. All the redeemed will be following Christ wherever he goes. God himself will inhabit the aggregate redeemed. I gather this means his throne will be among them too. I assume there'll be no limitations for the redeemed in the world to come like there was in Eden. Further, there'll be no falling. There'll be no dissatisfaction. Those are just some, because they'll, they'll hunger no more. Those are just some things I thought of off the top of my head. So, no, there won't be. But that, that question has plagued some people. It broke out once. Will it break out again? Yeah. Maybe another way. Of, of looking at this question, the answer to this question is that the, the conditions for which sin could break out in heaven then are being settled now. Good, very uh, good. Amen. Amen. So we're already choosing. See, we're already choosing. That's right. Sides, and then the, the, the weaker part of us will be gone. That's right. Yeah, amen. That's right. Praise God. Brother Given? Yes. We also don't have any record of any angel falling after that time either. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I say they, they already proved. That's right. Yeah. They, they survived the great fall, so yeah. they proved yeah. they couldn't fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, we learned from the entrance of sin and death into the world that there is no geographic location which reduces the possibility of sin. This is why it's very unwise for any believer to limit their it's very unwise for any believer to limit their contact with fellow believers. Yes, amen. I mean this I'm not into making laws and this sort of thing, but it's that's not very wise. Amen. To have the majority of your exposure to unbelievers, this accentuates the opportunity for Satan to work. Well, those are some uh, brief remarks about things I saw in Genesis. I, I'm uh, I'm still thinking about it. It's very it's very uh, stimulating Amen. to think about how much can be traced back to Genesis. And I'll have some more things, uh, Lord willing, next time. Examples of apostolic expressions found in Genesis. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight? A couple comments on Genesis 3. Uh, I, I don't think that that passage has not really been, the depths of that have not been plumbed very well by the church. Most people think only in terms of, you know, God is some kind of guy who just makes rules, you know, and, and then you're not supposed to break the rules, and when you break the rules, you get punished. And this, this is kind of how people think about yeah. what happened there in Eden. But a better way to think of that, the, the, the choice for them, that tree, when God said, don't eat from that tree, what, what was really going on there? And the, the two paths that humanity could take that's right. had to do with God mm -hmm. or no God. That's mm -hmm. right. That's what it's all about. That's the issue. Are you going to live with God mm -hmm. or are you going to strike out on your own? Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, 
if you strike out on your own, hmm. there are some consequences. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's namely, the issue. namely yeah. death. That's right. the. Yeah. the yeah. Thing. Yeah. And another another thought I had was on Romans five. That's another passage like oh, people. Yeah. <laughs> this a lot of people have trouble with this because it's usually read as if some some theologians have said Adam sinned and you get the guilt for yes. what Adam did. And people today, people, modern people go, hey, that's not fair. Yeah. Like you can't blame me. For yeah. what somebody else did, but see, actually, what he's saying is there. There's two humanities, right. or there's two there's two men who yeah. represent two kinds yeah. of people. There's Adam kind of person, sin, death, unrighteousness. Yeah. There's a Jesus kind of person, righteousness, obedience, eternal life. Amen. Amen. You know the scripture is. Uh, <clears throat> The nature, of course, of you, you know, the progeny can't arise higher than the progenitor. That's right. But when it comes to something imposed on you, uh -huh. death was imposed. Yeah. Yeah. Because of Adam's sin. You, people don't die because they sin. People die because Adam sinned. Yeah. But they sin because of their nature. That's right. Amen. That Adam passed along. Mm -hmm. Yes. I liked how you brought out this point when you said that this account, Genesis account, should establish to us that there is no physical or geographical location on earth where men will not confront temptation. Yeah. That there is a location yeah. where a man can combat this temptation and yes. be victorious over it, and Amen. that's where we've been seated in the heavenly Amen. places. Mm -hmm. And then also, um, this question that you said people have asked, and I've heard people ask this too, about uh -huh. is there is there a chance that sin will enter again once mm -hmm. we're into heaven? And, and the Lord said, and there shall... In no wise yeah, enter uh -huh. into yeah, anything yeah. that defileth, yes. neither whatsoever worketh abomination uh -huh. or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen. Amen. So the right. Lord has consoled us with Amen. this. Amen. He's given Amen. us this hope, and and once we are there, we've made it safely. Amen. 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 Yeah, there's no reason to ask the question when you read that. There's That's no right. reason to ask Amen. the question. Amen. Yes. You know, the, uh, modern men, they don't like things that are complicated when it comes to religion. Yeah. When it comes to other things, they love complicated things. But, but um, you know, there, from one aspect, salvation was, was a risky thing. There was a certain amount of risk. That's right. And yet, from another perspective, they, they were finished, the works were finished before the foundation That's of the world. That's right. There was nothing that was going to stop this. And yet, if, if, if Christ really could have sinned, then there... And he really, he really could have, but see, he didn't. but he didn't. So yeah. see, I mean, it, it, but see, uh, people, you know, they, they struggle with these kinds of things. But it's really, when you see it from God's perspective, uh, all the things you mentioned, all these things that were said in motion before the foundation That's of right. the world. See, so when see, we got confidence is the point. People, they ask this question, was it possible for Jesus to sin? Is it possible for man not to sin? See, but these are the wrong questions. Yeah. Uh huh. He sits out before you. Jesus didn't sin. That's right. So that's the point. The point uh -huh. isn't could he, yeah. is did he. That's yeah. the point. Mm -hmm. Just like the point with you isn't could you believe, is did you believe? Yeah, that's right. See, that's, that's the point. So you're, you're right. People, they, they like to philosophize about these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But when it says Jesus didn't sin, you're wasting your time discussing right. whether he could or... Uh -huh. You're just wasting your time. Yeah. He didn't. Mm -hmm. And just the words he didn't yeah. doesn't mean he couldn't. Yeah. That's right. He didn't sin. Amen. Mm -hmm. You did sin. Uh -huh. So you might discuss for a long time whether it was necessary or not when uh -huh. you're done. Yeah. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, all hell. Amen. That's right. Yeah. Yes, but I just want to say I, I enjoyed the the format of this. This is my this kind of lesson reminds me of like when you started these meetings <laughs> yeah. you know, many years ago. Yeah, it was more of a doctrinal. Yeah, and there's lots of ways we can we can talk about the things of God. Oh but yes. What you did tonight, I think, is very profitable because it starts us thinking about the doctrine of Scripture. That's right. And how all these things fit together, and how how Scripture is a unified revelation. Amen. And it all fits Amen. together. 
and that's this. So this is this is a very uh, profitable kind of of uh, yes. lesson for us. Mm -hmm. Just Amen. the way I was particularly in blessed and impressed with it, with just the words the beginning yeah. mm -hmm. and how much it's there mentioned mm -hmm. in scripture and how you that's where you got to start your thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It frees you from speculation. See, you're, mm -hmm. you're on solid ground there. Because he told you what happened in the beginning, he told you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Again, all these things are these particular words you've been using, like beginning and light and wisdom. All those things are preparing the way for Christ to be. That's honored. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. He says he is the beginning yeah. and the ending, yeah. and he is the life. Mm -hmm. And all the traces of wisdom and knowledge are hid in him. Mm -hmm. And if man's essential problem is sin, well, he's the Lamb of God. And so all of this, this revelation, I can see why Jesus would say, these are written of me. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because he really, God has, God has, has orchestrated the scriptures so that Christ is the expectation of them. That's right. This is why they were written. Yeah, that's right. See? Mm -hmm. Yeah, God is teaching us his language in the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm. It's like when you teach a young child yes, right. how to yes, speak, right. what this word means or what this picture is. That's mm -hmm. what the Lord is doing in the yes, book of right. Genesis so that we have a foundation to go back to so that we can yeah. understand God. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are, amazingly, there are some people that can't think of newness of life as beginning. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Hey, well, I can't remember a time when I wasn't. Uh, uh -huh. See, they can't, it's a hard for them to think, but see, this teaches people how to think. That's right, amen. You no, know, anything you have uh -huh. had a beginning. That's right, right. Amen. amen. Even if you had a propensity to a, a sin of some sort, mm -hmm. it had a beginning. That's right. You, was, you, you had your own tree. Somewhere there was a yes. tree. Amen. That's right. mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for the book of Genesis and for the faithfulness of Moses, Your servant. We stand in tribute of him for being faithful in all his house. And we pray You would continue to assist us in seeing the scope and the depth of Your Word. In Jesus' name, Amen. Mm -hmm.